ought to be listening. Throughout time and around the world, wise and aware people emerged bravely from among their peers to become singular voices crying in the wilderness. Vox clamantis in deserto, imploring all who might seek the ways of peace with justice. Often a lonely voice, always a needed voice. It was perhaps the divine speaking to us, and we ought to be listening. With open minds and willing hearts, let us meditate on these timeless and timely messages. May we then summon the courage to personally and collectively work to bring our world closer to peace. Sadly, their exhortations remain relevant today. Their concerns are still our concerns. Imagine our most ancient voices beginning this eternal cry for peace and justice, repeated throughout time, daily, hourly, this very minute. These noble concepts have been expressed in so many ways, as if we need to hear these messages from all sides and every angle in hopes of perceiving the incredible blessing they would be and realizing their potential. Listen to old thoughts voiced many years ago that all share a simple vision of a world becalmed with inner peace and universal justice. Sufi writings share this story. Past the seeker as he prayed came the crippled and the beggar and the beaten. And seeing them he cried, Great God, how is it that such a loving creator can see such things and yet do nothing about them? God said, I did do something. I made you. A Chinese proverb teaches, if there is light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. If there is beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. If there is harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. If there is order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. Buddha taught his followers to resolutely train yourself to attain peace. A biblical proverb instructs, defend the rights of the poor and needy. We also hear in Isaiah, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither will they war no more. The Roman playwright Plautus noted that the statement, he means well, is useless unless he does well. Reformationist Martin Luther declared, hell is paved with good intentions. For millennia, these messages have continued to reverberate. Thirteenth century Persian poet Rumi wrote, Yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I am changing myself. Chief Crazy Horse of the Ogallala Sioux Nation prophesied, I see a time of seven generations when all colors of mankind will gather under the sacred tree of life and the whole earth will become one circle again. I salute the light within your eyes, he also said, for where the whole universe dwells, for when you are at peace and center within you, and I am that place within me, we shall be one. 
Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore wrote, he only has freedom who ideally loves freedom himself and is glad to extend it to others. He who cares to have slaves must chain himself to them. He who builds walls to create exclusion for others builds walls across his own freedom. In his farewell address, George Washington proclaimed, observe good faith and justice toward all nations, cultivate peace and harmony with all. American cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead observed, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. President Abraham Lincoln declared in his second inaugural address, with malice toward none, with charity for all, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Humanitarian and lecturer Eleanor Roosevelt noted, the trouble is that not enough people have come together with the firm determination to live the things which they say they believe. Freedom makes a huge requirement of every human being. With freedom comes responsibility. Democracy cannot be static. Whatever is static is dead. Mother Teresa shared simply that a smile is the beginning of peace. Bishop Desmond Tutu preached that if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. African-American educator Booker T. Washington declaimed, I will permit no man to narrow and degrade my soul by making me hate him. Mahatma Gandhi once said, peace is not only the absence of violence, it is the presence of justice. Audre Lorde, a self-described black, lesbian, mother, warrior poet, professed, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. American labor leader Cesar Chavez pointed out, preservation of one's own culture does not require contempt or disrespect for other cultures. Nelson Mandela observed, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love, for love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposites. Musician Jimi Hendrix said, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. Nobel laureate Thomas Mann stated, war is a cowardly escape from the problems of peace. Let us also be aware of the clarion call of our youngest generation now issuing forth with urgency, strength, and directness. Malala Yousafzai started her drive for female education in Pakistan at the age of 11 and was shot in the face by the Taliban because of her activism. At the age of 17, the youngest Nobel Peace Prize laureate ever, she wrote, if you want to end the war, then instead of sending guns, send 
books. Instead of sending tanks, send pens. Instead of sending soldiers, send teachers. Emma Gonzalez, an innocent young woman from Parkland, Florida, was a student at Stoneman Douglas High School during a tragic school shooting. Her life changed that day and she was thrust into global consciousness at the age of 17 when she powerfully gave voice to her generation's frustrations. During a speech most likely heard around the world, she proclaimed a brutally honest response to the litany of reasons and excuses her generation has heard over and over again for a lack of effort and action. It became a rallying cry. We call BS. We ought to be listening. Activist Gloria Steinem noted that social justice movements come out of people sitting in small groups, telling their life stories, and discovering that other people have shared similar experiences. Speaking to us all through the Lorax, Dr. Schutz shared that, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. No, it is not. Cornell West, professor of public philosophy at Harvard University states, justice is what love looks like in public. Eddie Hilsom, a Dutch author killed in the Auschwitz concentration camp said, ultimately we have just one moral duty, to reclaim large areas of peace in ourselves, more and more peace, and to reflect it towards others, and the more peace there is in us, the more peace there will also be in our troubled world. We ought to be listening. We ought to be imagining peace. Thomas Jefferson shared this distilled thought, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel noted, there are times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. And finally, philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson challenged each of us to always do what you are afraid to do. And his friend, Henry David Thoreau, offered this encouragement. Go confidently in the direction of your dreams Live the life you have imagined. Imagine peace. Imagine peace. Imagine, Imagine 